Welcome back, everyone, to the philosophy of art and science. As always, if you support these programs, you can join the YouTube channel directly at various levels. You can also head over to patreon.com slash A-K-S-U-M. That's Aksum. Today's special guest is Ed Lattimore. Welcome to the program. Hey, thank you for having me, man. How are you? I'm doing well, doing well this fine morning. You are an avid chess player. Uh, I actually expert. just finished playing a game uh, right before we got on. No way. <laughs> really? Yeah, I'll, 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 you know, yeah, I always try and play uh, one or two a day. And but but the but the big thing now is like I put a lot of time into studying because you get, I'm at this this level where I can't improve unless I really study. Uh and then and then I can go and you know play for fun. But it's all fun. But <laughs> so, so you have to tell me about that because this is interesting. A friend, uh, um, I have a few friends we play. I, I used to play online, but um, I'm a little bit of a shit talker when I play chess. So I, I, I like to see who the person is. So even if I play <laughs> online, it's usually somebody I know. And he he knows like the names of all of these chess strategies. Um, oh, okay. I have never been able to learn that way where you like study the strategies and then you implement in the game i sort of i picked him up from a chess master in high school certain certain moves but i a lot of what the chess that i learned was through practice how it, it how do you do it is it is there youtube uh, tutorials um, or so books or? so here's what i i do i have a first i have a coach that is a big difference uh because when you have a coach you have someone you can go over games with Mm -hmm. and but the, but the big thing the coach has done for me is he's taught me how to understand what the what the engine is saying right so if you run your game through an engine and it makes a suggestion mm -hmm. uh it says that move is bad or or like i use chess.com so it goes inaccurate mistake blunder right and sometimes <laughs> it's really obvious right but other times you're like why and then that's where coach comes in the coach also comes in and they, my, my, my thinking about the game has changed a lot. Uh, for example, like I understand one of the, the like the difference between strategic and tactical uh, weaknesses and strengths as well. And then how to kind of uh, form the latter, you know, strategic strengths. So you can set up the, the former, the tactical uh, attacks and, and manipulate those in your opponent's camp and also like okay so then the other big deal is a plan a lot of players don't play with a plan and it's mm -hmm. usually because they don't understand kind of what the objectives are on the board and that was a big change for me as well like i, I look and i go oh, what do i do next well the, you, you get that lost feeling in a game where you don't understand the plan uh and what the objectives are kind of what the what the uh what is his name? Uh, Silman says, like, uh, the, the board should kind of tell you what to do. And that sounds really weird. Uh, when you first get introduced to that idea, he has it in, in the amateurs. I think it's called the amateurs. Got it right here. The amateurs mind. Uh, by the way, this uh, is, is if you don't get a coach, this is a great book to kind of change how you think about uh, different things, but having a coach along with this, because you can only teach so much in a book, whatever, right? Unless yeah. you're like really, really like super gifted, but then you don't need a book called the amateurs mind. <laughs> but one of the things is, is, you know, you look at what the board is giving you based on the opening you played and what the opponent does. And then from there, a certain plan kind of presents itself. And, 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 you know, this takes kind of the fun out of chess, but for me, I'll never be this good, so it's okay. In the purest sense of the word, chess isn't even a game. In in the and when we define a game, uh, there has to be an element of uncertainty and random and, and randomity. And chess has been worked out. Like you can't the the strongest computer in the world, no human will ever be able to be. It just uh will no always figure it out. We, we can't say the same for like a poker match because there's an element of uncertainty and so it's not really a game in that sense but but for all intents and purposes with humans it is a game so when we're playing i'm looking to see okay what are the palm breaks in this position which is like a crazy idea well but it seems obvious to, to strong players but when you're first coming up and you're improving your 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 ability 
uh, you're like, oh, what do I do in this situation? I don't see any good move. And well, well, is the, the position broken up? Okay, if the position's broken up, is it semi open or is it semi closed? Well, those are the same thing, really. But what are the the targets now in the position? Okay, now you've identified targets. Are there any tactical weaknesses to attack or any tactical weaknesses to exploit or to try to exploit based on the position of strengths? Okay, no targets, nothing to break. Well, how's your position? How's your worst place piece? Um, or rather, what is your worst place piece? And does improving that or can you improve that in such a way where you don't open up a weakness in your own camp? And can you strengthen your position as well? So these are like tactics are not tactics these are like um uh ways of thinking about the game that present uh, a plan and when you have a plan then all of a sudden uh it, it becomes one it becomes uh easier because you're no longer just kind of you know playing hope chess right you're like okay here's this idea let me see if i can execute it and then we can correct that right because i if i i, I just had a lesson where I misread the board, right? And and it's funny we were playing through one position that I went through, and then playing through what 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 could have happened in terms of just just um, what the position would have looked like, and the whole game would have been different if I had understood the plan. So that's all you understand in the plan, and and from there the moves kind of jump out at you. If, if that makes sense, or at least the, the, the likely candidate moves to support the plan, but you got to, you know, choose the plan based on what the, the board is presenting to you. It does. See, the sort of, um, you know, Jordan Peterson has made the analogy about chess and life saying that the role of, you know, biology. And I think this will relate to some other things that we talk about. It's a, is in a way a limiting factor. At the same time, there are a whole lot of moves that you can do <laughs> in chess. Other people have compared jujitsu in chess, although the big difference I see there is, is to your point, chess is static and yeah. jujitsu <laughs> and, and fighting in general is, is dynamic. You don't say, okay, unless you're doing like a really uh, childish version <laughs> of boxing as a kid, you know, like slap boxing, you don't say, okay, your turn. Okay, my turn. Okay, your right. turn. Right. <laughs> going on. There are, there are analogous. There are, there are these really great analogies to life. Uh, my, my three favorite in particular are, are chess, poker, and boxing. And and neither, I don't think any of them are complete enough to describe the whole thing. That's why they're analogous, not like uh, a model of life. And the, the, the difference there is that the model is simplified, but uh, more or less covers all aspects, and that's impossible. So instead, we find something to where we can look at it and go, this is like life. Or this is like certain aspects of life. And the aspect of life that chess is like is that you will get absolutely demolished in your daily living if you don't learn to to consider the second order, if you don't learn to look at the landscape that's given to you and make a plan based on that. You will get demolished if you don't realize what everyone else around you is doing or at the very least try to try to hypothesize and then respond to that. Uh, generally speaking, a plan is better than no plan, even if it's not the best plan. Uh, so that is one of my favorite kind of, of things. When I first started playing, the guy who, um, who taught me to play, he said, you know, no matter what, never make a move for no reason. And but what that forces you to do is, is explain and put your thinking to the test. And and that right there bugs a lot of like you can always tell how serious someone is about improving at, at really anything based on how how willing they are to explain their process regardless of the outcome. Okay, uh, it's very we're very it's very natural for us to explain why something uh, didn't work out and attribute that 
to factors beyond our control. Uh, Annie Duke calls this outcome fielding. You know, kind of when it, when I do it, when I do a great job, it's skill. When you do a great job, it's luck, because we're <laughs> always we're always living in comparison. And then when I do a bad job, vice versa, right? When I do a bad job, it's luck. When you do a bad job, it's because you're incompetent, kind of deal. But the the correct way to improve at anything is to always go what can I do? How can I get better? Uh, what did I do incorrectly? And, and chess really, it, it hammers out. I mean, I think all, all really anything where there is immediate kind of feedback uh, does that where it goes, oh, well, well you know, th- there's no luck here. You, there's no BS in here. Either you got it or you didn't. I put a post out on Twitter or, or I said, you know, you know, forget self. And I put it on Facebook too. You know, forget self-improvement. Hey, here's what you should do. This, these are the three things you should do: train in in a combat sport for for a minimum of two years, and and take actual fights. Uh, learn a foreign language to at least the B1 level of competency, and live on commission sales for a year. And someone pointed out that what those three things have in common is is that the, there's no way to BS your way through any of that. You know, either, either, you know <laughs> even if you're not a good fighter, uh, you're you're gonna go through the workouts and get in the ring, and you will change because you're facing real negative feedback. Um, B one B one fluency or our competency in a language, and this is by um, the European framework of, of mm-hmm. languages or something like that. I, I can't remember what the exact um, what, what the exact anagram stands for. Uh, but some sort of intermediate level. Yeah, that, that that's it, that's the ability to kind of. I, I said it to some guys, like you know, you you can get dropped off in that country, make it to your hotel, order some food, and you know, have a conversation with people about what's going on. And, and the key is to be able to do it speaking and listening, because because you know, I, I'm 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 in my language learning journey, I'm starting to understand that reading and writing is like the most deceptive kind of it, it lets us think we know and we don't you you don't know shit when you can just read and write you you can because no one does it like we we learn a language to kind of talk and then you got to train your brain to work and then same with living on commission sales either you either you eat or you don't eat and not really any uh <laughs> middle ground there no no way to bs yourself i mean yeah, right I, I i am glad to say i have um i have done all those three actually the thing i've done the least there is sales but i i have done a, a year of sales in the uh in the form of uh, head hunting for uh the tech industry my my martial arts were as a as a child i did five years of taekwondo and then most recently i've been doing brazilian jiu-jitsu for four years oh nice man yeah and um i'm uh I'm, I'm a language guy english is actually my second language i'm hard oh no kidding what's your first i'm hark the official language of ethiopia that's my that's it's my called first hark yeah okay i'd never heard of that before you learn something new all the time that's one of those things uh i've, I've found americans in general are kind of bad with with languages but it's not our fault. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they call us they call us the monolingual culture, and part of that is because we're the coolest. But what I will tell you is, um, <laughs> uh, I read "Talking Back, Talking Black," and I reviewed it on my channel. It's by John McWhorter, the black uh, linguist. He's out in New York City. He's, he gets uh, popular in the YouTube circles as well. But he he likes to emphasize the dialect of he calls it black English. A lot of the white folks like to call it AAVE or African-American vernacular English. And back in the days, you know, it used to get derided as Ebonics, but he showed how it's not just a few words of slang that's different, but there is an actual intelligent grammar to it. Like you said, that is learned in and a spoken dude, form. And that, dude, when you say that, I, I, I got to check this out because it's really interesting because, because a lot of, you know, my, my fiction, uh, well, what I'm what a writer fiction writing. One thing I really realized in in coming up with the way the characters speak, and it, you know, it all you know draws from my experiences somewhat, is that you ever watch a movie set in the hood, or or, or like any anything set urbanly? And I'm just you know off the top of my head, the the two things that come to mind uh, are The Wire, oh, that yeah. whole series, and then yeah. Contrast. That it was a great movie that came out. 
uh, I want to say in the 2000s called Pay in Full. And, and you know, then going back even older, Boys in the Hood, uh, Belly, I'm just trying to think of these, these films. And, oh, yeah, and, and right, yeah. And, and here's something interesting that I, that I never realized until I started trying to create kind of the way characters sound myself. When you watch those movies, the 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 dialogue is incredibly uh, authentic, for lack of a better term. But but is it really? And, and I say that because there's a system of communication. When we, when they're talking, we kind of understand what they're talking about, even even without any formal knowledge. You know, like like in a. Um, and the while when they start talking about points on a package, right? You, you, you kind of know what that means, you know, or the re up and stuff like that, you know, or, or holding down, a, you know, a, bl- a block or things of this nature. And when you 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 speak them in context of something else, uh, then it, that's how you learn a language anyway, is watching, watching a, how it's used and then see you know how people respond and what they're referencing maybe body language whatever which you can't do in writing but uh the idea is that you still get context clues and it it's so cool to hear how a whole new system of what it's not whole new what it is is it's a system that they're 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 looking and taking and using it, but it sounds natural. You I mean you might not know what the mm-hmm. exact words are, but one of the things they recommend, for example, when you learn a language is, is if you if you need to know what every word means, or you're gonna go crazy because that's just not that's unreasonable. So like one of the big things I'm doing right now with my, my Spanish is I sit probably 20, 25 minutes a day and and I listen to a uh, YouTube video in Spanish, you know, but I make sure I get one where they have subtitles and I put the mm-hmm. subtitles on in Spanish as well. And and this was from a language tutor of mine. He said, okay, you need, you need to stop watching it with the English subtitles. You need to get your brain used to hearing what you like, like see what you can see those sounds. It's that whole reading thing. You can see those sounds, but now you got to get used to hearing what they sound like coming from a native's mouth. And that is mind blowing because you hear that and you go wow they really don't like no one pronounces it the way i thought they should uh i've been and which spanish is it because there are different spanishes too oh right so so my my teacher uh the all of them were through colombia oh okay which is a which is a very crisp and clear kind of kind of spanish but a lot of the stuff on youtube is from spain Mm-hmm. Which is also and also a lot of the shows I watch because Spain has the biggest budget of all the Latin American countries. I'd imagine a lot of the shows are from uh, Spain as well, and that's like what's the best way to put it? It's very pure. Uh, like one of my buddies is the the Dominican, and that is, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's like on the, a tape recorder that's- sped up times three. <laughs> like that's hard <laughs> for my ear to pick apart. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mexican, like they're swallowing the vowels. Sometimes. Yeah, Mexican though is is very. It's not as clear as Colombian, but I can understand that. Mm-hmm. But the Dominican and then like Argentinian Spanish. I had a teacher from Argentina. Uh, okay. That is not even Spanish, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> that that sounds like Italian, hey, even down to the way they they pronounce the letters. It's very Italian. It's not. Um, but but once a huge you... Italian population, so I think I think you're you're absolutely right. I had a I had a an Argentinian professor in college in high school. I had a, a Venezuelan and and a Mexican um, two different teachers. And yeah, I think you're right. All of the people I've talked to have said the Colombian one is the prettiest one. So yeah, um, at the very I'm least, it's the clearest. I had I mean. Zero. Hey, here's how it's a funny story, right? Uh, we, we were in Cartena and trying to get back to our hotel. And the name of the hotel was uh it was it was hotel something. I can't even remember what it was called. But I kept saying hotel such and such whenever we were like the, the Spanish name of the hotel, mm-hmm. but calling it a hotel. For some reason in my brain, that just made sense because it was a proper name to me. As opposed to what what they're saying, once I started calling an hotel, they were like, "Oh, I know where to go." I was like, "Huh?" Yeah. So they don't see it as a proper name, even though it's treated like a hotel, a proper name 
in um in English. And we we were in, but then the second time where I was I was that second time I wanted the times after this, uh, we were in uh, Puerto Vallarta, and the place we were staying was called Hotel Musa. But when we went back, it was, it was Hotel Musa because otherwise no one would <laughs> know where yeah. to go. And that's funny because that word probably is invented in English, but when they take it, like they. They no ages in the egg, right? It, it's funny. We we have a place. It happens all the time here. Like we have a neighborhood here in Pittsburgh called North Versailles, and and when people see that who don't know English, who don't know French, that they don't like that doesn't register mm -hmm. uh, at all. But when you when you look at it, that's that's Versailles, like the the Palace of Versailles, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and and it, it's funny, man. Yeah, the, the way they pronounce it. I was on a, a flight to Honduras and there was a, a Nicaraguan next to me. And I was trying my best to, to practice my Spanish as well. And he was listening to American music and he was telling me, do you know Deuces? And I kept looking at him <laughs> and I was like, what is he talking about? And I realized he was talking about Chris Brown deuces. Mm -hmm. But it took me the longest time. <laughs> he said Deuces. Yeah, it's it's funny. You don't you don't realize it. But that whole listening to the uh the English music and everything, uh when we lived in Portugal, man, and then the Portuguese are are, are fantastic uh linguists because as I understand it, they're one of the only countries that does not dub anything. Wow. Everything is subtitled. So right out the jump, they are listening to uh other languages spoken the way we we you know we speak them or we had a waiter at this spot we went to and we just became a regular uh his english was so incredible i thought he was a god that, that moved uh and decided to take up a job in in portugal but he never left lisbon in his life and oh i was god. like that's crazy but he and i asked him i was like so what would you do how'd you learn this he was like he said well we all got to take english in school but you know live video games watch it <laughs> video games and watching uh, sports music like it's pretty much what i'm trying to do right now uh little just just watch listen and then i'll you know mimic back and repeat back and and i think that is the way we we have i'm, I'm so in awe at the world because we we have this tools like like right now this conversation is taking place I and mean, you're like three thousand miles away but it's like you're effectively in the same room as me and that's cool uh but in terms of like what we can do and learn and our knowledge you know i can sit like after this call i can sit down and and watch someone speaking Spanish and then say it back and parrot it. And then if I need a lesson, if I need to have a conversation piece, I can go and set up a lesson uh, real fast on the internet. And, you know, I, I wish people took advantage of all of these tools to make themselves more intelligent and more better. Like, like my chess coach lives in Hungary. Like, wow. never been, I've never been to Budapest. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, well, but there, that is what we do. You know, we have a good time. And, and I lived when I was in Portugal, I was able to communicate with everyone around the world. I got, um, uh, buddies in Brazil. We, we talked to, and, and there's that too. It is, it's, it's, it's just an amazing time to be alive because of this thing called a satellite. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. How did you begin, like, whether it was the, the chess or the language learning, how did you begin finding the online teachers? Like, did you just Google, like, chess teacher, language teacher? Or? So, okay, so so funny that you say that, man. Uh, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I have this this big following on social media, but, but anyone can do it. Cause I'm not like their only teachers. And so I, you know, I'll mention or be talking about something and someone will go, oh, okay, you know, you want to do this. Well, like my chess tutor, for example, some guy was like, Oh, you play chess. You want to play a few games? And then he was like, you know, you, you need some, some help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't think he said it like that, but he was like, yeah. you want to check out my, my teacher, this guy, Eric Kislik. And, and I said, sure. And so I got put on Eric, who's an international master, which is the second highest, uh, title you can hold, but he's probably stronger than most the mini grandmasters. He just focuses on teaching now as opposed to competing. Mm -hmm. so I said, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So I did that. And with with Spanish, uh, I was talking about this one day with somebody on, on the internet, and they were like, hey, you want to try on my company, Baseline? And so try to Baseline. What Baseline does is they connect 
uh, people who live in in Venezuela and Colombia to the internet and they give Skype lessons, you know, in 30 to one hour minute blocks. And they're not even lessons. Like you can structure your, your lesson kind of the way you want it to be, depending on your level and what you want to accomplish. But what you do get is you get a chance to talk with someone mm -hmm. and have them talk back to you. And that is an incredible resource we have today. We can sit down. If a person wants to, you know, they can get a full blown English, a uh, full blown foreign language education between websites, YouTube. I have I have the Pimsler app on my phone. I remember when Pimsler used to be like some you had to carry with like CDs. Now it's just an app. Right, we're, we're, we're recurring twenty dollars a month, and and I get to go and whatever language I'm, I'm working on, I can just go do a lesson, and it's all speaking, and it's all great. So so there's there's tons of, uh, you can enrich your life in pretty much any way possible. <laughs> yeah, that your approach to training or improving yourself, like not just being satisfied with one level, but continually upping. It, it seems to be something that's big in, in martial arts and your, your martial art that you spent, I think the most time with is, is boxing, is boxing the world that taught you this mentality or did you have it before then? You know, it was great, man. I tell people all the time. So my, my, um, I got a, I got a post about this on my website and everything. My bachelor's degree is in physics mm -hmm. and that comes with a minor degree in mathematics. I mean, I, I took, I, I, when I think about it, I'm pretty sure I took as many math classes as I took physics classes because because I got a BA in physics. I didn't get a BS. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a slightly modified degree path because I really uh, came to see the value of, of, of writing and being exposed to different ideas. So I took a slightly less intense track. But but it was still, I mean, let's not get it twisted. It's, it's still it still like 48 credits of, of physics. Uh, but I bring that up to say that when i was in high school i was i failed a lot of math classes i did not do well at all in math uh and and i had no confidence whatsoever in my mathematical abilities i figured that like that 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 level of life that path was going to pass me by and there was going to be nothing i could do about it i was never going to be a math guy right uh and with that any quantitative discipline and then I started, you know, so tuck that away. I started fighting when I was 22, and I wasn't really that good at fighting. Kind of, I mean, I was, it was okay. I mean, I got a few lucky things here and there, but in terms of understanding how to fight, uh, I didn't really have that. What I did have was this commitment to the sport, and mm -hmm. I said I'm going to continue to try and get better no matter what. That took me from where I started to going to a different coach who's still my, my coach who's a good friend of mine now. I help him out with stuff. Um, to And then when I get with him, I, then I win a, a, a national. Or I won a state title. Takes me to the nationals. The nationals gets me recruited to go out and train with these guys in L.A. While I'm out there in L.A. where they're paying me now, I get a, a, a national title. I get a national ranking. I really have a great go at my amateur career and I go from being this awkward kid who didn't understand fighting at all or really anything truly athletic. I mean, I was a lineman, but that's not like the coordination and, and the agility you need to fight to being what I ended up becoming in boxing. And that experience changing myself physically, not just putting on muscle, but but legitimately developing this, this is a skill. I mean, I was talking about this yesterday with someone and I said, you know, part of what makes boxing so hard is that it's it's not just punching, it's probably the easiest part. Really everything else, you know, training your nervous system to do something completely different uh, in the face of a dangerous stimuli than you're you're naturally supposed to, to control your conditioning and breathing, to stay focused when you're in pain and you're gonna be in pain no matter what because everything hurts in a fight. Uh seeing myself do all that, said, okay, if I can do that for my body, what else can I do there for? And that gave me the confidence to go and reapproach math from bottom up, filling in my weaknesses, gave me the confidence to go and really approach learning the language, learning chess from the ground up and understanding because that's what you need. You need one thing to teach you how to learn something else. Right. 
if you can get that from somewhere, uh, it doesn't matter where really, but it's going to be difficult and it should be challenging and you should feel like you're going to fail at some times, uh, then you're going to be okay. Like, like what I have, I talk about the things boxing gave me uh, because it, it didn't give me money. I mean, it gave me some money, but certainly, certainly not much at all. Uh, I, I can say that within <laughs> within one month of being done fighting, uh, I had no more flowing income money uh, from boxing, or whatever. But what I did have was I was I had a mentality, and it's a mentality you, you just it's a mentality you have to earn. No, no one can just give you uh, what you get through pushing through difficult things. That's that's something you earn. That's something you now I carry with me, and it's my approach. That's that's my ethic. That's how I do everything from from my writing to working with guys to to my learning and even how I enjoy life. You know, everything is really a uh, the cool thing about boxing is that uh, there's a feedback mechanism and it's a pretty mm-hmm. vicious feedback mechanism. <laughs> certainly, certainly more vicious than anything else you're ever going to do uh, outside of like combat training. Uh, like actual like combat training because death is is a great kind of feedback mech. But you get this feedback mechanism, so you you really understand the value of 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 being diligent, you know. But you also to get better, you have to take risk. It's it's this weird, you know. It's it's a it's a so it's, it's a weird kind of paradox to improve a fighter. You have to get comfortable with the idea that your that you might suck. Okay. And it's only in getting comfortable with the idea that you might suck that you can get better. And that means, you know, you got to, you know, take take it on a chin. That, I mean, literally, that you're probably going to get hit a few times is you learn how to how to not get hit on the chin. And that's how I approach everything else. Like when you like when you're when you're learning a language, you know, what do they say? They say you have to um, communicate and, and to talk no matter what. And everyone's like, oh, you know, I don't want to sound. Uh, what if I don't know what I'm talking about? I'm like, no, trust me, no matter what, you're not going to know what you're talking about. It's a, it's a new system of speaking and communication. Just just get to it quickly. You know? I was made fun of viciously because I told you Amharic was my first language, yeah. but I was born and raised in the U.S. So it was just because my parents were just very strict Africans that, yeah. that they made me speak that. And um, I guess like your contact in Portugal who had learned English while in Portugal. I had learned Amharic while here. And one of the big things similar to Spanish of Amharic is you have to roll the R. And the same way where if you pronounce the H in hotel versus hotel, they don't understand you. If you don't roll the R, they won't understand you. And up until I was 19 years old, even though I spoke it as a as a child, I couldn't roll my R's. And people would be so vicious. And uh, my grandma gave me this advice one time. So I just went in my room and I put in about a thousand reps, not in one day, like over a long yeah. period of time, I would just try to roll my R. And I'm telling you one day when I was 19 years old, I, I, I roll my R. Now I'm 30 and I've been rolling my R for over a decade and people never think that I couldn't have done it. Right. It's weird. I, I say like once you have it, it's like you always had it. Once you can do it, it's like you could always do it. You know, no, no one knows, no one remembers, no one really cares. Hey, like every now and then, someone will remind me, and I, and I never forget because it's not like I was doing it my whole life. People are like, you know, I remember when you know I knew you before there was you, you fought. And I'm like, that's true, and I, I actually have kind of. I mean, I remember who I was, obviously, but mm-hmm. like, yeah, you know, once you have a thing that's part of you, it's like it's always part of you. Yeah, it's interesting on the on the note of uh, of boxing and the the skill aspect to it because like you said outside people sometimes you know there's so many different types of boxing fans they they might just appreciate you know the knockouts as opposed to all the technicalities and and the leading steps to it i i wonder if you have any thoughts on the kind of saga that's been playing out between deontay wilder and and tyson fury in the heavyweight because as far as i'm concerned by the way the only division is the heavyweight division and i think that (laughs) mma and others because i go to things like the nfl and the nba and you don't see things like separated by weight class and by height and all these things yeah everyone is a heavyweight in the nfl you know you're light do they even make wide receivers under 100 pounds anymore i guess corner (laughs) corners will, will still be under 200 pounds uh, but that's probably the only position that where like you can 
you you can be competitive um and and not weigh at least 210 but um yeah I, as far as everything going on with with uh Deontay Wilder Tyson Fury I can you know speak into it from a from the perspective of a guy you know who's who's fought and who under who kind of understands what's going on um I I think <sighs> Fighter's pride is interesting because what a, what a fighter has to have is his pride. He's got to feel like, and his confidence. He's got to feel like he can he can do um, the job. It's everybody else's job around him to to one make sure he can do it, but if he can't do it, uh, kind of protect the investment. You know, mm-hmm. so like when everyone when everyone says someone's ducking somebody. I guarantee you, Nate. If there is any ducking going on, it's not the fighter who's the promoter. It. It's it's the people who have a monetary interest in and in maintaining the image. It's the promoter, the manager, those guys who might with the coach who are like, okay, maybe not yet. All right. So so what's that got to do with the the Wilder Tyson thing? Why do I bring that up? Uh I I like Wilder because Wilder is a late starter. Um, and, and he has done, done, done very, I mean, he's, he, that just goes to show you the, the, the great thing about fighting, um, the, the, the great and worst thing is that when you have, uh, one tool that can, that, that can end someone's consciousness, you can go pretty far. I think water is, is once the fight, I think fury wants to fight. Uh I, I think that the fight between Fury and Joshua was should have been a fight that they, they let happen and go on with it. Because because from a from a fan perspective, I'm not really interested in seeing I mean I'm sure it'll do okay, but I'm not really interested in seeing Water Fury because as far as I'm concerned uh, Fury won the first fight, but they had they had to give it. But one, but one understands it, it wasn't so blatant that you're like they robbed him. But uh, it's any any boxing. I haven't talked to one person who thought that uh, it was a. Uh, the, the, the very least, no one thought to, Water won. There's some guy that will defend the draw, but but for the most part, you know, I, th- I thought Fury won the first fight. Uh, the second fight was so one sided. That um, uh, that the third fight, I I anticipate more of the same, if not worse, because because the guy who's training him, I know the guy who's training him, and I, as far as I know, he has not trained any other fighter. So maybe maybe that you know, there's that untested kind of kind of thing. Uh, but also, it's not like Fury got any smaller. Oh, this is one of the the, the big things that made a I think made a big difference in the fight. And is it, is it water is not has I don't think he's ever fought anyone even his height. I mean, I think the closest guy was like Dominic Brazil, who's six six, who was still smaller or still shorter. Um, and 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 no one with that level of skill. I mean, I guess the closest one was Louis Ortiz, and but Louis Ortiz like six three and damn near fifty. Man, like <laughs> it's not estimated. Yeah, yeah, you know, so. <laughs> So, so I, I think you know that they make the fight, um, and they bring the fight on. And what will, will probably realistically happen is is that Fury wins, and Wilder is now in this really weird position because right now, if he goes and takes other fights, he builds himself up, develops his skill. Uh, makes a little more money and, and you know, kind of rides the American train. He's going to make a lot more money fighting uh, fighting Fury. But what I think happens is is after Fury beats him, and it'll probably be in the same fashion, um, and it might be faster. I, I didn't realize that was in the seventh round when I watched it again. So, you know, those fights fight super, super quick uh, when you're in real time. But it's like, okay, so who do you fight now? Uh, you, you you're gonna come on, you know, two losses back to back, both for for a big for two title fight losses, and it, because if Fury loses, this is not the same for Fury, by the way, because Fury's got the win 
right? Mm-hmm. Uh, on the last fight, but if if Wilder loses, uh, he's got two losses back to back for the title, it, which 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 you know puts the nail in the coffin. Like you're not even close to getting up. Like like right now, we can we can argue about the first loss, but I'm I'm of the opinion that he lost the first and the second fight, and I think he'll lose the third. And if if that you know if slash when that happens, then it's gonna be hard to get another fight after that. Uh, you know, like because while the guy anyone will fight him because he's the money guy. It's like well, well, and he's not even the money guy. The money guys are Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua. So how do who? So so anyone worthwhile that can bring in revenue, why why would they take that fight? Because it's not like he's not dangerous. Uh, <laughs> so, but but now it's like, why do I need to go through that? You you know, not now. Let me go fight somebody who because people still for whatever reason sleep on on uh, Anthony Joshua. And I'm like, you guys don't understand anything about fighting. This is this guy's probably the most complete heavyweight since Lennox Lewis. Um, and and Lewis got two losses, but he avenged both of them. Mm-hmm. Uh. And I think that's that's gonna be the same th- same thing. Well, my my point is that if, if Wilder loses this fight, man, we I don't think it'll be like the end of Wilder, but I think it becomes very difficult for him to be relevant because because all of his the fights that he could have taken and made, or no one is going to be interested in making them. That's kind of the issue why they fought so hard for this one because they know that if the if if all the belts go to because that's that's what would happen. You know, Fury Joshua is a unification belt. Yeah. Uh, if all the belts go to one or the other, uh, now it's like we don't we don't we we like we don't need to deal with that. Like and, and no and no one really wants to see that fight either. I mean, like if if Fury beats Joshua, no one's going to be interested, especially if Fury just beat Water. So so your chance of getting the belt short of somebody declaring you the mandatory is is no and if joshua gets the belts well well he's he's so big um uh, that, that he just he makes the rules basically uh for the heavyweight division that, that's part of what was what the issue was uh before but the, there's also you know you come over to wembley and and see how that goes and uh fighting fighting you know the business i, I say it all the time and the business aspect of fighting is is far more interesting than the physical aspect of of it, uh, but but my, my to sum that up, I think that I think they made a strategic mistake, and and really one of the best things that happened to them was Fury testing positive for COVID. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't think it's gonna make too much of a difference, but Wilder needed his time because what he's trying to do, he's he's got to learn how to fight. Because he's dealing with a guy bigger who knows how to fight, so he so it's it's are you learning how to 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 use the rest of your tools, learn how to fight? Uh, you can't just rely on the right hand because not only can he take it, he can slip and, and be in a real position to hurt you at six nine or six seven. It's not really something you're used to. So I we'll see. I mean, I'm 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 certainly gonna watch the fight because because I'm curious to see you know. How much a difference a year makes a training, uh, intense training. I have an idea, but I want to see. Yeah, no, that that's a good analysis to see if he's doing that skill improvement that that you've been talking about. And yeah, but but he can only get so much better in that amount of time because <laughs> you know, like 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 Fury, uh, just just I mean, he fought harder guys and had to beat them in a different fashion because Fury's not really a knockout artist when you look at his power. Uh his KO percentage. So he's had to learn how to fight, even though he's like six nine, which is weird. Uh but but it's uh and, and on top of that man he's demonstrated numerous times not just against Wilder but also uh he's got a pretty nasty knockdown he sustained against uh Steve Cunningham. Uh we, we know in other words we know Fury can take a punch. Uh, and so that, that's gotta be in his head too, that like, well, not only can he get out of your punch, but on the off chance you hit him, he's going to get up. So, uh, and you did it yeah. twice. I mean, some guys don't get up the first time he did it twice and he got up and you can only get a draw that you're, that you really was kind of a gift. So, 
And he was playing up that Gypsy King title. People were saying he was using Gypsy magic the way he got up with the resurrection. Uh, there's, there's a great meme uh, where they they overplayed the uh, the old Undertaker music. Yeah, I've seen it. And, and he gets it, and then you know zooms in on Wilder's face because yeah, man, yeah, if you've got this punch that is like hospitalized guys. And he takes two of them and gets up. Yeah, you probably are gonna be a little shook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the way he got up with it was crazy. And so, as you were saying, like with the uh, with AJ with Andy Joshua, the negotiation hour. If he were to unify all the belts, and this whole business aspect is more interesting. That that segments me to something that you know my audience is familiar with. Something that begins with the matrix but then goes into various spheres online yeah. is this idea of the red pill and i think the original context in the movie was something to the effect of uh, a general kind of left-wing anti-authoritarianism and skepticism of power but as it gets applied to the manosphere and later, even to the opposite wing in in politics, like my yeah. uh, there was a someone on my channel, Curtis Yarvin, who had popularized it in terms of skepticism towards the media and towards universities. But you are also a, a dispenser of this red pill. Could you could you tell my audience how you encountered the the red pill and and what um, you know what its what its use is? Well, yeah. So, so as far as I know, I mean, as far as I approach it, and one thing I've learned is that everyone has their own approach. You know, it really is a one true Scotsman type deal, and it's kind of ridiculous. But uh, I, I apply the idea to, you know, seeing through what is what is prescribed or thought of as the popular mainstream. Uh, trod and true advice for a thing it just so happened that the area that, that it originally grew from was involved was there was the dating arena because there were there were these set of behaviors and ideas that men were taught that they should be and and they were not only were they not getting results but the opposite was working so a few of these guys are like what are we doing here why is this you know uh not working why is that working oh let me let me see the reality of the situation i ate a red pill uh, and, and could you probably, briefly just tell them like what like is that just this whole nice guys finish last thing or oh what? right right so so you know it, it was this idea because you know there's so many things change so rapidly and and finally things are really just getting caught up and on top of that we have the internet where you can really disseminate knowledge and see and see things for what they really are but the the idea here that i'm talking about is are some of the conventions you know men are expected to you know for example to be chivalrous and, and that is not rewarded anymore certainly not in the you know certainly not in the phase that men want women when that they're but most which is when they're, when they're most fertile and productive well they're fertile with childbearing years it's like women are most attracted to women but but now things have changed and now women at, at those ages and times are are not interested in in guys at least in mass yes there's still small pockets um and you can go if you want to go have that find that but that's a different thing beyond the red pill which is you know we uh before i go any further you know what we're talking about the red the red pill angle and perspective and that's important but i just want to say the 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 dating market as a whole from my understanding of it is is just an absolute um disaster for 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 two primary reasons uh one how women are treated two how men are are behaving and and you know the, the it, it can go vice versa easily how women are behaving and how men are you know treated uh either way you, you both sides get the blame I'm only talking about uh the red pill and how we use it and talk about it but the idea pretty much is that all right so it's so women aren't interested in these traits anymore they're responding more to these traits and we were seeing that initially but now with now they're and this was like in the, in the late shit what is it 2021 when did i even well, say like 
the early 2000s, right? That's when you get exposed to these ideas. But even then, the internet wasn't what it is now. Uh, what God's been really able to swap ideas and, and see things, but but now God see this, and and for the first time, I think in a long time, there's a there's a big shift in in how many guys embrace and understand this. We we see this, for example, a lot of guys are not opting to get married because they have seen the divorce rate, you know, mm -hmm. everyone goes out of divorce rate is fallen, but uh, I always say that's, you know, to, to get divorced, you have to get married by definition. And that is falling even <laughs> faster. <laughs> Yeah, so that's right. let, let's that's a not good way to read the data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you have to learn how to how to how to you know use that and or not use it, but read it and understand kind of what what they're what they're showing. But but that that's one area because guys were tired of being taken to the cleaners. It's understanding that the, the laws, for example, in in um what is it in family court are incredibly skewed towards towards women to the point you know where where if it was. It, you should expect to see if it were fair and remotely fair. You should expect to see kind of a 50 50 split, maybe, maybe a little more, you know, 55 45 in favor of women because we will go out on the limb and say gods are more susceptible to criminal like behavior. But like, you, you shouldn't expect to see 80%. That's insane, right? So we know something is wrong. We know how how men are being, and and, and, and you know, it, it all started with dating because that's what's most important, right? There's a great quote that goes, "Without you know, without tits and world, Alexander the Great would have been Alexander the fuck it, right?" <laughs> and, and and it's important to understand. And this is something that, that a lot of women just don't get, and that's fine because why would they get that? It's not their job, but but guys inherently understand. You know, uh, a lot of what we do consciously or subconsciously is for a reproductive opportunity. When when that opportunity is not given to you or when there's a heavy cost that comes with it, pursuing it in, in a strategy that has been talked about for ages, yeah, you have to wake up and adapt. And that's kind of what the red pill, to me, talks about waking up and adapting to this new world. Uh and, and a lot of guys, for whatever for whatever reason, mainly, you know, and then and, the... And, 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 the big reason why guys don't adapt it is one because that there are many whose parents are still like, oh, their parents are boomers. I say Generation X. They they got a, at least a little more hip to this, and and guys who are like uh, a little younger than how, how old are you? Thirty. Thirty. So so you, your parents were likely uh, late boomers, early Generation X, but guys who are like whose parents are like late. Uh, Generation X early, um, well, well they, we shouldn't be millennials, but like, yes, pretty much <laughs> firmly in, in X. Like those, um, those people are were, were indoctrinated with that. That was not even indoctrinated. The world was different. There were different pressures, and so what worked for courtship was still kind of a good idea. All that's out the window now. Like, like you know, for you, you take girl flowers on on a date, man. Good, good luck. You're gonna be angry, right? But that's just one of those ideas that's not mainstream. Okay, it used to be considered kind of this red pill taboo. Now it's acting like a jerk, whatever, right? Now, uh, with that said, uh, a lot of things debunked, whatever. Like if you act like a jerk, you know, chances are the girl really likes you. When you do that, there's a problem. Uh, but guys really ain't thinking about that. They just, you know, oh, most of us just want. Uh, an end shape, not old woman. Like especially in those those years when like when you're like in your early twenties and and guys are like, oh, why this happened? Why she cheated me? Why she leave? And then they go and understand. They go, wait, you're telling me the stuff I was doing that I thought I was supposed to do directly contributed to the deterioration of my relationship and she just kind of played along like we're not talking about like slapping somebody around it's like where it's obvious like yo it's not only is you gonna leave but there's gonna be problems but like no where you'd be like like splitting the housework or something like that you know <laughs> things of that nature <laughs> 50 -50. Um, no, that don't work all right they, they, there's no there, there's no you know one of like for example one of the big things uh one of the biggest truths and it, and it really shouldn't be a truth but but it has to be one because the world didn't work this way before and now it does is you know once you have once you are with someone you got to kind of you have to continue improving and working on yourself 
Uh, you you can't just slack off, and if you do, you know, don't be mad if she decides uh, that you're not attractive anymore and starts stepping on you. Because now loyalty, in the, in the sense that we have been, we were brought up to kind of think about it, them, them days are gone, right? Uh, th- now it is very much, and you have to maintain who or what you are, and continue to get rid of. and and that and that still just improves your chances. You know, because for example, we didn't we didn't have this. We didn't we didn't have this smartphone here now. Now you know, someone can reach out to your woman at any given time, and and it just it's super simple. And then on top of that, you have the culture encouraging her to kind of put herself out there, where we either implicitly or implicit or explicitly, uh, it, it's it's a it's a tough world, especially even if you have condition. You know, even even what worked twenty years ago, nah, man, things things are off. I mean, I I met my girlfriend on online. I'm my, my my fiance girlfriend is still she'll always be our girlfriend. I think it's important to maintain that. But we met her online, you know, nine years ago. And uh wow. and that and and that is uh that that's back when it was like kinda still odd to do it. Now, you know, it's like, what do you mean you met her in person? Like was it an you, explicit dating app or what Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely explicit dating app. There was no IG yet. I always tell people from what I understand, Instagram is the Instagram's the new dating app, you know. <laughs> people people slide. for those who know how to use it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So no, nah, it that's that's the world we're in. Um and, and I think it's really important because if you don't understand this, and I had a great presentation on this. Uh, if you don't understand this, you're going to fall victim to the system. And we need guys to not fall victim to the system because contrary to what with, uh, what they might try to have us believe, you know, guys are really important to society. Men and women are important. But, we, you know, uh, but what seems to be happening right now is the, the role of men are being, you know, is being downplayed. And not, that's not just a, a um, perspective. Hard numbers show this for example uh one of the more disturbing things i saw is that okay so you know boys are diagnosed uh with adhd at a rate of four to five times higher than girls and 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 if adhd was unless unless you're telling me adhd is a sexist disease (laughs) we have to assume that something about the way boys behave uh is different than girls but what is but what the boys do is wrong, and we have to treat them it is I think as Rollo Tomasi says, uh, they treat boys like defective girls, and nowhere is that more evident than in the ADHD diagnoses, right? Or what that's one in five, or rather, that's for every one girl diagnosed, four boys will be right. That's crazy. When 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 reality is guys just need more energy and work and, and effort. They just want to or they just want to go you know run and be physically active. You know? I know this is the pet project of Dr. Umar Johnson. If you've ever come across him, because he's a clinically trained psychologist, and one of the big things he would say is that if you just look at the demographics of the people who are diagnosing those boys versus the the demographics of those boys. He says that that picture itself paints a lot of the picture. Yeah, and that that's that's un, unbelievable, and and no one, there, I don't want to say no one. There are lots of people, but it's not. Uh, one of the reasons why we refer to it as the red pill is because these ideas will never be mainstream. They'll never be there, and so what you have to do is you have to, you have to live that and use it and move with that knowledge and find like minds but to expect the mainstream to to ever but but now is there even really mainstream because because now everything you know that i really think content knowledge is decentralized uh not just on big browsers and big search engines, but now people can meet up more easily and talk and direct messages and get each other's numbers and connect it's a lot easier to connect and find people to learn from so uh, we, we can continue to improve that way. It's really cool. It, it is. So a number of times we've discussed these adaptations. I think one of the incredible adaptations that, that you've been able to have in your life is to have this successful career as an author. I found out about you looking at a, a gum road. I was making my own gum road and they have you in the highlights there. 
and you have, uh, like you've said, Twitter and Facebook that you use to write, but you also have these books that you've published, Not Caring What Other People Think is a Superpower, Insights from a Heavyweight Boxer, Sober Letters to My Drunken Self, Engagement is the New Cocaine, The Art and Science of Writing Awesomely Addictive Tweets. And I like that because Art and Science is in the title of my podcast as well. <laughs> so that's 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 a great way of uh, great minds think alike there. C could you talk about how you uh, became a prolific writer and you know the the relationship of your books to what you're doing on Twitter and Facebook. Oh uh, yeah, so, so I've always enjoyed writing. I mean, my website is got. I'm always putting articles up there. It's it's cool. I have a, I have a good time with that. That's edlatimore.com, right? Yeah, yeah. I think there's some like there's a, there's over a hundred because I remember I, I celebrated when I put a hundred up and end of it, but I don't. I don't know how much more than a hundred. Now I have to go look and count uh, one of these days, but. Uh, to me, uh, I've always enjoyed writing. I've always wanted to be a writer. Uh, it's just that when I was a kid, there was no internet, right? Not now that there is, you know, there's there's other ways to to make a living putting words to uh, we'll, we'll say screen. I was going to say paper, but who does that anymore, <laughs> right? Uh, but but to me, uh, writing organizes my thought process. And in doing so, it allows me to formulate a better argument and think about things more coherently to know what I'm talking about about something. But like I can have an idea and it'll just float up here until I sit and write it. And then I go, okay, that's cool. I can see that I can understand it. And and you know there's no car there, there's no articles left in the original form from when the, the site first went up because I've I've improved so much. I one of the big things that helped my improvement was getting a degree in physics, believe it or not, because they that forced me to become a much better communicator uh, with the precision of the words I use, and also kind of the the brevity or economy. I'm I'm really big on word economy, and I always try to improve it. And you know, I won't I'll never sacrifice clarity because if no one knows what you're talking about, it doesn't matter how how brief you are. But I'm always trying to be as efficient as I can, and I got that habit from writing for physics. I'm always trying to create uh, and then really take my knowledge and, and disseminate it, give it to someone so they can use it and they can get something from it and they can find my work. It's, it's really cool that, that I get that I get to do that, you know, that I can hop onto my website, put something out there and someone reads it, gets something from it. They are able to take my experiences and use it uh, from, a, from a business standpoint. Uh, if you can do it, uh, writing is is writing is not how you get rich. Let's let's lay that out. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously there are people who make a lot of money doing it. I don't make a bad amount of money whatsoever. Uh, but it's not. But it's not because. But it's because I do more than write. You know, I know how to use it. I understand that that all writing does is is collect attention, and hopefully you collect the right kind of attention and then you convert that to other things you know uh understanding that has made my life has changed my life uh across all all fronts even my books on on amazon the idea people were like why are you even putting a book on amazon you don't make that much money like, nope no you don't understand putting a book on amazon because it gives me legitimacy mm -hmm. and and it's a little slower of a play but now <laughs> people find me for stuff. Uh, it was easy to get. It was it was easier, I should say, because I had a thing for boxing. It was easier to get, you know, verified. I get my uh, my Wikipedia page, or, or get so you know when when people look me up based on what they see. When I sell things, it's easier because there's all this stuff that can that, that when you look me up, I show up. Yeah. All right. So that's that's what writing, you know, is is for me. It's 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 a kind of a passive attention grabbing vehicle. The the goal is that it, you know it it becomes this, this passive massive income generator. Right now, it's an okay like 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 if, if you break it down, you know, it's like I think from like book book royalties, not counting Gumroad, that's a different beast. Uh, mm -hmm. But but like book royalties from Amazon is probably like twenty five hundred a month, which like apparently is incredible for a writer, and that. It's crazy, like like to me <laughs> to offer offer two books in your catalog, because I mean I, I think there's four technically, but but two I really 
promoting and moving and show, which is when I care what other people that think is a superpower. And um sober letters to my drunken self to have that kind of revenue off of two books in, in the catalog. It's not bad. You know, but but I'll add and continue to get better at marketing and it, that's the other thing. It's a self development journey. Uh like boxing. But you know, I didn't just I, I, I didn't get where I got from just being able to fight, you know, I had to learn how to how to sell tickets and and get along with people and make connections. Yeah, those those are related, and and it's it's good to to put it that way. So it's interesting when you brought up physics again. One of the things that I had read that you had written that I, I want you'd explore for my audience because it's something it's a co very common theme i had a biochemist on who would talk about you know she was a more explicit believer but i think one of the mainstream ideas is that there's an antagonism between science and religion i, I would love if you could share with my audience kind of thoughts that you've written elsewhere about um study the study of physics and what if anything, has that done for you in relationship to you know thoughts on organized religion or God? So okay, so I'm 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 of the opinion. I've always kind of been of the opinion that uh, religion is okay. So so spirituality is is the the light source. Religion is is the result of it hitting a a, a prism, right? You get different. Every religion gets something right. Every religion gets some wrong, misses something, right? Because um, there, there are social systems uh, that happen to use as their centering social piece spirituality and and God. All right, so that's my view on, on religion in general. As far as my my thoughts on, um, well, we'll say. My my thoughts on on God, on the universe, or whatever you want to call it, intelligent design. Uh, when you when you start studying uh, physics, you you realize something really interesting because because first of all, what what is physics? Physics is, is the the study of physical science. Everything from electric, you know, there are different subsets, but everything from electricity down to uh, molecules and how they work to motion. You really need it's, it's you understanding how the world works, and you start to see certain redundancies in things. And those redundancies, I mean, they started to bother me, or a repetition, not redundancy. You start to see repetition uh, in certain places. Certain formulas work for things that there shouldn't be no reason why they would work that way uh the, the the big transforming moment for me where i was like okay uh i've always believed that i came the you know, way we came from something but but i think there's some type of intelligent design going on in this in this universe whether you're you're of the the uh what we'll call it the new skeptics idea that, that we're in a holographic universe or you believe that it was all created by one God, or that there is this intelligent force permeating the universe. We, we call it different things. This is the the, the religion aspect of what we're, we're looking at it through our own perspective and lens. But what we're all hinting at is that we did not make this, and there's something that predates us. All right, and this universe in this space. I remember when I learned uh, time dilation and length contraction. Uh, relativistic calculations, how things change based on the speed, uh, the what percentage of the speed of light, uh, the velocity is that they're they're traveling at, and and I looked at the equation. And I said, "That's crazy. That is the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> Why is that here? They they figured that that out like, um, in in I mean." Phew, BC times. Point is the one. Point is it was it was way before uh, nineteen. Was that fifteen? General relativity, I think. Right, way before then. All right, but when you look at the the way it works, is it's it's a quadratic. Well, not quadratic. It it is the Pythagorean theorem. It it is now it's arranged in a certain way, but but that's what it is, and and this same idea shows up. 
uh, which is where you take, and I call it the Pythagorean theorem, but it, but it really is just like a way to calculate absolute distance, uh, where you take uh, the x-axis and the y-axis, or, or your your two axes, your, your two dimensions, and you square them in case one is negative or positive, and you add them together, and you take the square root, and that's kind of how you get um, the absolute distance travel. And that when you look at that, I don't know like how familiar you are with like the Pythagorean theorem. That's like the basic thing they teach us in elementary school. You know, a squared mm -hmm. plus b squared equals c squared. Or if you look at that, that that's really to calculate the dis displacement between kind of two points. You use to calculate the hypotenuse of a right triangle, right? And what is that? That's the length from the end of one to the, the end of the x-axis to the end of the y-axis, or the other way around, right? Flip. Uh, point is, when I started to see, when I saw that worked to calculate how long uh, we should expect, or how short we should expect something to shorten, or how much smaller the the length should contract, or how much longer something should it be, feel, based on its speed, uh, and how much how much how close it is to the speed of light. I was like, wow, that's really cool. That means that like somewhere someone said math is what we're going to use to describe everything and here's some here's some uh we're just going to keep using that pattern right and i said that's that's really cool man and then you look at like sinusoidal the the uh, the math we have for sinusoidal motion uh mainly cosines and sines uh, and and how that works, and we see that works not just for that works to describe waves, cyclic function, and we see waves all over the place, and they you know everywhere everywhere from from the water right the way those waves to light to sound it all travels in waves. I I cannot I I cannot believe that that it's just random that everything just chose a wave form to move in. No, right there there is. <laughs> If a straight line is the shortest distance between two points, why did everything choose to make itself a wave as it as it moves instead of just being a a ray or, or a straight line, right? Seeing those things across different domains, you go, wow. You really gain a, an appreciation for how the world is connected and seems to follow the same basic blueprint for a lot of things. The same formula for are calculating the the uh, voltage drop, right? I want to call it electric difference, but I guess that that's correct. Is also the same for for gravity. And there's no reason for those two things to work. And when I say the same, I mean you can plug in, plug them in just with different quantities or are different measuring different things. A better place to see this is uh, the 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 law for gravity and Coulomb's law. Gravity is a, a gravitational pull is like the, the the mass of object one, the mass of object two times the gravitational constant divided by uh, the radius squared of the or the distance squared between the two things. And we can figure out the strength of the gravitational force or pull between them. That's the same thing as figuring out the electric charge of two things. Columns constant, right? Multiply by the charge of one, charge of two. Divided by the distance squared of the uh, between the two, and we can figure out the the charge generated. And I'm like, okay, no, like like we we couldn't just force fit that in, you know. Otherwise, we get different numbers, and we'd have to adjust our calculation. And we know this because if we do get it wrong, uh, we 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 get the wrong number, we get the wrong prediction. This was uh, the people people talk about. Okay, one was general relativity ever useful? Well, we we had to readjust. But um, we had to know that formula to adjust when we started messing with GPS because we are high enough. The satellites are high enough to where their time is different than our time. And, and it's not by a huge amount, but it's enough to where it would it would obviously you get lost. And it's moving fast enough, 15,000 miles per hour, to where the time is traveling a little differently up there as well. So you're dealing with the special and general relativistic effects of a satellite moving that fast, that high above the Earth, trying to coordinate with people down here and tell them uh, what they're trying to do. And we have to, it's not just the, the, it's not just the amount of time it takes for the signal to go up and down, but the time is different on both ends down here for us and the frame of reference up there for them. So we have to uh 
calculate that in. So we know what happens if we get the wrong calculation. We we get the wrong. We 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 wouldn't be able to use that technology, but that technology works so much so that like people younger than like twenty five have no idea how to use a map. I'd imagine <laughs> because why? Because why would they? Right. Uh. But but yeah, that 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 stuff. That you, you you just see stuff like that over if you're thinking about it if you're just going through the motions like it won't won't jump out at you until someone points it out but but once you realize like the math just repeats itself but with different variables like the formula for the relationship between these things is the same it's just that the things are different you you can't ignore that i i, I can't ignore it anyhow like like I understand, you know, the the it's not just that they're analogous either. That that would also be different, but they're, they're the exact same thing. Like <laughs> as I demonstrated with like the the formula for gravity and the formula for the charge on a uh, for a charge, it's the same thing. Like same thing. All you do is plug in different variables. Same with the the time dilation versus uh, length contraction. It's the same formula for for um. I can't remember what it's called in statistics, but it's the same idea. But 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 that that works, and it also works in uh for distance in a two dimensional plane, the the Pythagorean theorem or uh, displacement on a two dimensional plane. But same idea. Point is, these things continue to show up, so I have to believe there's a design there. Like there's there's no reason uh for for it to be this repetition uh, or artists repeated. If it was just random, we would expect a random result. I guess. I I appreciate the the wonder with which you you think about this, this sort of cosmology and and the beauty that that physics and mathematics is is teaching us, especially this idea of the relativity of time was highlighted to me at a very young age in reading um the science fiction series ender's game by Orson oh Cotter. yeah i love that the the that series yeah you remember the wiggins siblings when ender leaves earth um he is traveling at like something approaching the speed of light or something so that when he gets in communication on the other side with his siblings you know his brother has like spoiler alert become like the hegemon of the world yeah he's got some high advisor position and it's like 30 years have passed and he's like the so same for him, it's like yeah it's nothing yeah that was a big um that wasn't an ender's game that was in the um the second book that that's a big deal speaking yeah. for the dead yeah. i you know what that that used to be one of my favorite books and i'd be i you're the first person i've met who's ever referenced it to me before <laughs> i said it that's that's cool man yeah i i, I love that and um Thank, thank you so much for being so generous with your time again today. Is there a place? So obviously a bunch of your fans are going to find this, uh, but for those who are the new fans of Ed Lattimore, where would you like them to start? Is there a particular book or a particular blog post or um, video? Where would you, you know, just show up to the website, man. I don't, uh, one of the cool things is, is that I, I try to write about, my experiences, my thoughts, uh, my perspectives on things is it it doesn't matter where you start. You'll get something and you'll become a fan. You know, people buy from me who didn't buy from me for, for two years and they're like, oh, well, I read that and that resonated. Let me check out your book or whatever. So nah, you know, wherever you start is where you start, man. I'm I'm happy to have you regardless. Perfect, perfect. So everybody head over to edlattimore.com and thank you so much for joining the program. Thank you for having me, man.